Good morning. My name is Steve Gould, and today I'll be discussing the 6th New York Cavalry in the Civil War, and specifically some of the sixth, uh, some of the Southampton and East, Ham East End men who fought in the 6th. We chose April because uh, April has several very important dates in it relating to the Civil War. On April 12, 1861, the Confederates fired on Fort Sumter in Charleston Harbor, which started the Civil War. And on April 9th in 1865, uh, Lee surrendered his army at Appomattox. April 16th in 1862 was also Emancipation Day, in, uh, which ended slavery in, only in Washington, DC. Um, unfortunately, it took several more years for emancipation to occur throughout the country. And in May, we celebrate Memorial Day, which was originally called Decoration Day, when flowers were put on the graves of Civil War soldiers. The first national celebration of Decoration Day took place in May of 1868 at Arlington National Cemetery. So what makes me interested in the 6th New York Cavalry? And I ask myself that uh, question quite often. Um, there are so many interesting units that came from uh, the East End and from Southampton area, um, fought during the Civil War. One of those is the 81st New York Infantry, which was led by Edwin Rose from Bridgehampton. The 127th New York um, Infantry Regiment raised many men from the East End communities. And interestingly enough, from Amagansett, several men joined the 15th New, New Jersey Infantry Regiment, which I thought was kind of an intriguing place for people to join up. But my real interest in the 6th became um, more, uh, more direct when my wife, Bonnie Grice, produced a play based on the Stephen Crane's book, uh, Red Badge of Courage. And Bonnie encouraged me to um, get some items that might be useful or interesting to show as an exhibit um, if, uh, as part of the play. And so she introduced me to uh, Tom Emmons, and he was nice enough to take me into the basement of the Southampton Museum. Um, and there I found this hat, which is in the basement collection of the museum. Another thing I found in the, cross, in the basement was uh, this ammunition pouch. And the ammunition pouch was listed as coming from a soldier by the name of Alonzo Foster, and I thought that was kind of interesting. Um, and I thought Alonzo Foster seems like kind of a made up name. Um, didn't think that was a real name, but uh, it turns out that the name Alonzo was actually more popular than the name Stephen back in the 1860s. So I was kind of shocked at, the, at that fact. But so I did more research about Alonzo and um, it turns out that uh, in a book that I read that Alonzo may have fought at Gettysburg. So that became sort of an interesting uh, line of thought. So I pursued the name Alonzo Foster a bit further. And it turns out that Alonzo Foster wrote a book about his experiences after the war. And so I found the book. And as I was reading through the book, uh, he writes about a particular battle that he fought in. And during that battle, his cap was shot from his head. And he said that he kept the cap as a reminder of his experience in the war. And I'm pretty sure that this cap is the cap that he wore on that day. So who was Alonzo Foster? Alonzo was uh, five, foot seven feet, five foot seven inches tall. He had blue eyes and dark hair. And he, and he was the 14th and youngest child of John Foster, who was the descendant of Christopher Foster, one of the early settlers of Southampton. Alonzo was 12 years old when his father died, but he stayed on his father's farm in Hampton Bays, which was then called Good Ground. October 15th in 1861, which was six months after the fall of Fort Sumter, uh, it was Alonzo Foster's birthday, and it was also the day that he chose to volunteer for the Union Army. And he was responding to this um, ad, which was one of many ads in local papers at the time. This one's from the Sag Harbor Express, announcing a public meeting that was going to be held at the Good Ground Methodist Church, where Reverend Smith H. Platt, who was an ardent abolitionist, was speaking. And I love this uh, ad, talks about, this is a rare chance for good pay, $16 a month, and good service. 
boys of old Suffolk to arms. And uh, inspired by that uh, presentation by uh, Reverend Platt, Alonzo and several of other young men uh, volunteered to join for three years of service. And by the end of October, uh, 27 men from the North and South Forks volunteered for the 6th New York Cavalry. And they were joining, joining not just the Army, but the Cavalry. This is a typical Cavalry soldier. This one actually happens to be from the 6th New York. His name is or was Andrew Sutton, and he had the nickname Bottles. I'm kind of curious about how he got that nickname. Um, at the time, the Union Army was organized into three branches, uh, the infantry, cavalry, and artillery. And the military hierarchy was uh, divided into corps, division, brigade, and regiment, with the regiment being the basic building block for the, uh, for the Army. So several regiments would create a brigade, several brigades would form a division, several divisions would form a corps, and several corps would form an army. And in the East, the army, the largest army and the most important army was the Army of the Potomac. A typical regiment would consist of about a thousand men organized into 12 companies, at companies A through M, but skipping J and I, uh, skipping J, which could be confused with I and L, and each regiment composed of about 100 men. Uh, the South Fork men were assigned to Company F, and the North Fork men were assigned to Company H, and each regiment was led by a colonel. Here's a typical cavalryman. Uh, this one, this man is acting as an orderly. As uh, after the fort, fall of Fort Sumter in April, 1861, everyone thought the war was going to be a short war and recruiting for the Union Army was fairly slow, especially for cavalrymen, which was a very expensive branch of the army to raise. But the Battle of Bull Run uh, or Manassas on July 21st in 1861, which was a Northern defeat, indicated that the war was not going to be short. And Lincoln must have thought at that time to paraphrase a line from the movie Jaws, you're going to need a bigger army. So uh, that's when uh, recruiting efforts began to really ramp up. And that's when the 6th New York started to be recruited. Civil War statistics can be um, confusing, um, especially for the Confederate side. But from just general numbers, uh, total Union soldiers who fought uh, totaled about 2.2 million men. And of those 2.2 million men, about 650,000 men were casualties, which meant either wounded, killed, or captured in battle. Of those casualties, approximately 365,000 men died. Uh, on the Confederate side, about a million men served, of which about half a million men were casualties, and of which about 260,000 men died. So for a total of about 3.5 million men, uh, between North and South, with about a hundred, uh, with about a million and a half casualties, just a little bit less than half, and of those, about six hundred twenty thousand men died, and that could, number could be as much as eight hundred thousand men. Um, now, these numbers are not going to be on the exam after the presentation, so don't worry about memorizing any of these. Um, actually, there won't be an exam at all after this. Now, I think about it. Uh, New York was the most populous state in the United States in 1860, with a census population of about 3.9 million people. And the state also had the highest number of soldiers. In New York State, uh, the, the state mobilized about 400,000 men, of which about 40,000 men died. In Southampton, about 6,800 men uh, served, and South Hold, about 5,800 men. Although those statistics are a little bit complicated and uh, I need to de do more research on those numbers, but those are some of the numbers that I've seen. And just as a reference point from Sag Harbor, about 350 men served in the army of which about 46 died. So why were the men joining the cavalry? Um, they thought that it was gonna be glamorous service. Uh, imagine, gallant cavalry charges against uh, defending infantrymen. Um, but reality was a little bit less exciting. 
especially at the beginning of the war. The primary duty of the cavalrymen was to act as reconnaissance uh, or scouting for the enemy. And after skirmishing with the enemy, they would typically turn the fighting over to the infantrymen. And the infantrymen would often say, there's going to be fighting boys, the cavalry is coming back. And that's actually a quote from Stephen Crane's book, Red Badge. The cavalry also screened movements of the army, uh, keeping the enemy cavalry away. And occasionally a cavalry would conduct long distance raids to disrupt enemy supply lines. They also performed other less glamorous tasks, such as acting as uh, orderlies for senior officers. And Alonzo Foster described orderly duty as consisting in carrying messages and dispatches from one part of the field to another, and when not thus engaged, to be near the person of the general. Uh, more dangerous work uh, for the cavalrymen was called picket duty, which was essentially serving as an early warning outpost. And these were often manned by a single soldier or a small group of soldiers. Only occasionally and very rarely were uh, cavalrymen asked to make massed charges. There's often been a discussion about whether the North or the South cavalry was better. Um, many people thought that the Confederate cavalry was better, but uh, I don't think so. Um, mostly the Union cavalry at the beginning of the war was using inferior tactics. Uh, they used, broke their cavalry units up into small groups, unlike the Confederates who consolidated their cavalry into larger groups and used them uh, as a larger striking force. Confederate leadership was also more imaginative and bolder. Uh, here's Jeb Stewart on the left. Uh, he was considered one of the best cavalry generals and he had the romantic nickname, the Beau Sabreur, which means beautiful saber in French, obviously. Union commanders were a little bit less inspirational uh, and one Union general, uh, Judson Kirkpatrick, who is here on the right, had the nickname Kill Cavalry because of his, uh, the number of horses that he lost. And uh, I guess, who would you rather fight for between these two men? I think I would choose Jeb Stewart. However, with better tactics and leadership, Union cavalry men ended up becoming superior to the, cavalry, to the Confederates. So who were the men who's from the Southampton and the East End who were joining the New York cavalry? One of those men was Charles Whitney. He's a 20 year old man from, who was born in Atlanticville, which is now called East Quag. Charles was working as a farm laborer in Sag Harbor when he enlisted. He was six feet tall, he had gray eyes and dark hair. Some of the other uh, men who joined him, brothers in arms, was uh, Milton Bennett, who was 18 years old and a farm laborer from the Springs area of East Hampton. Milton became one of Alonzo's best friends and after the war, Alonzo wrote, he, share, he had shared my blanket, my tent, and my confidence for three years and was ever by my side in camp, on the march, or in battle. John Dix, who was 19 years old from Sag Harbor, uh, his father, William Dix, was born in South Carolina and he had married a woman from Sag Harbor. But the family's uh, loyalty was divided and John's older brother, William, had already enlisted in the Confederate Army when John mustered into the Union Army in October of 1861. Charles Jackson, who was 22 years old and lived in Hampton Bays before the war, uh, became good friends with Alonzo during the war. His mother died four days after he had enlisted and Charles' father remarried in 1864 and his new bride was one of Alonzo Foster's sisters. There was also a young man by the name of George Ware, 22 years old. He was one of twin boys uh, and his father was a shopkeeper in Southampton. George was one of the second wave of volunteers who enlisted in the army, uh, enlisting in September of 1862, roughly a year later than the other men. And unlike the other South, uh, Southampton boys uh, who were mustered into Company F, he was mustered into uh, Company M. Another young man who uh, joined was this man, Frederick Wadley, 25 years old. He was born in England, where his father ran a pub. And, uh, Frederick came to the United States in April of 1857. He had brown eyes, I'm sorry, blue eyes, brown hair, and was five foot, five inches tall. He was working as a farm laborer in Southampton before the war. 
and he too was part of the class of 1862 who volunteered. Perhaps he was looking for adventure or perhaps he was uh, supported the anti-slavery cause. cause. Um, but he was one of the many Englishmen who volunteered to fight for the Union. Uh, Frederick was also assigned to Company M. It's interesting, this picture of uh, Frederick was in Alonzo Foster's personal photo album and uh, was shared to, with me by his uh, great, great, great granddaughter, Christina Foster, who still lives in the area. Uh, these young men, 27 initially from the East End, uh, with five joining later in the war, were volunteering to join a new cavalry regiment that was then forming in New York called the Ira Harris Guard. This handsome young man uh, is Ira Harris, uh, reflecting the political nature of raising military units at the beginning of the war. The unit was named after his patron, Ira Harris. Ira's, Ira Harris was a senator from New York and he was assigned to the post after William Seward became Secretary of State in the Lincoln administration. Harris had married a wealthy widow of a former mayor in Albany. Her name was Pauline Rathbone. Uh, Harris and uh, his family was liked by the Lincolns and their families often socialized. In fact, Harris's daughter, Clara, and her fiance, Henry, Henry Rathbone, who was widow Rathbone's son and Harris's stepson, so keeping it all in the family, they were in Lincoln's uh, uh, box at Ford's Theater on the night that Lincoln was assassinated. And this uh, Courier and Ives uh, lithograph captures the moment when John Wilkes Booth shoots uh, Abraham Lincoln. And there's Henry and Clara in the box, reacting horrified at the event. Uh, Henry could not prevent Lincoln's assassination, um, but in the ensuing struggle afterwards, Henry received a vicious stab wound by Wilkes Booth. And that struggle may have uh, caused uh, Booth to lose his balance when he jumped from the president's box onto the stage in which he broke his leg and that may have helped uh, ultimately in his capture. Uh, that horrific event though was in the future and in the meantime, in the fall of 1861, the Harris Guard was getting organized at Camp Scott, Camp Scott on Staten Island. The East End men took the train from Riverhead to Brooklyn and then took the ferry from Brooklyn to Staten Island. And at the ferry landing on Staten Island, they were met by a young man, a young Lieutenant by the name of Robert Crozier, who was 19 years old. And Alonzo's recollection of, uh, of the young Lieutenant uh, was, I thought was kind of interesting. He thought that uh, young Crozier was exceedingly boyish in appearance. And I thought that was rather amusing because uh, Alonzo was basically the same age. So. There was a young man thinking that one of his uh, colleagues was, uh, was a lot younger looking than he was. At Camp Scott, the East End boys uh, were introduced to the farm life, uh, to the army life. And uh, early, in, early in the war, uh, Union logistics was not particularly efficient. And uh, the soldiers were often fed inadequate food. And on one morning, uh, the six New York Cavalry boys were being fed what they called rotten fish. And uh, they had had too much of that rotten fish. So they revolted, tore down the cookhouse and chased the company cook all over the, the camp. Uh, fortunately for the cook, he survived, but uh, the Union uh, men were not particularly happy with the food they were given. And ultimately the Union army was able to sort itself out and was able to serve better food. But uh, initially in the war, it was not particularly tasty. As the uh, Iris Guard, uh, the Iris, Ira Harris Guard formally uh, became um, organized, it would split itself into two different regiments, the 6th New York Cavalry and a sister regiment, the 5th New York Cavalry. At Camp Scott, they were introduced to their new commander, Colonel Thomas Casimir Devon. Colonel Devon was born in New York City and he was from Irish parents. He was gray eyed with a balding brown hair and stood about uh, five foot, eight inches tall. He was four years old and one of the older uh, commanders during to serve as a, uh, a colonel during the war. He was a house painter by trade 
And he also had an interest in military and he served in the first cavalry of the New York Volunteers uh, militia before the war. He was known to be cool under fire, but he had a habit of smoking his pipe when he was nervous. After completing their basic training, the regiment still lacked horses and their basic equipment. So what do you do with cavalrymen who don't have horses? You send them to guard the railroad. So the regiment took, uh, traveled from uh, Staten Island to York, Pennsylvania, where they arrived on Christmas Eve after a very di uh, difficult journey, which included an open boat ride during a winter storm. Uh, many of the soldiers became sick during the travel, including Charles Whitney, who developed pneumonia. The regiment was enthusiastically welcomed in New York uh, by the local women uh, who baked over 300 pies for the young men in Company F to celebrate New Year's. The railroads played a critical role during the war and uh, moving troops and supplies around the North and the South. Uh, and many of the major battles that were fought during the war were fought along the major rail lines. In early March, 1862, the regiment was moved to Perryville, Maryland, which was the location of the Union Army's mule school where the mules were trained to pull the Army's wagons. The mules did not greet the young men with the same enthusiasm that the York ladies had. Horses and mules died at a horrific rate during the war and approximately 1.2 million horses and mules died, which is about half of those that were drafted into service. War is a cruel and wasteful uh, action of, for both men and beast. Although getting closer to the front, the regiment still lacked its basic equipment and more importantly, horses. There were rumors that the regiment was going to be broken up and the men sent to the infantry, which uh, the men refused to do, and they threatened to quit if they were sent to the, military, to the infantry. Finally, on March 29th, 1862, Colonel Devon received orders to send one battalion consisting of four companies to join the Union Army's Peninsula Campaign, which was commanded by George McClellan. This, the Colonel Devon chose the 3rd Battalion, which included companies F and H. This battalion was sent by boat to Fort Monroe uh, on April 15th, 1862. And they arrived in, um, at Fort Monroe. Uh, the campaign, uh, McClellan's campaign started and the first significant fighting was at Yorktown on May 5th, uh, followed by some major fighting on May 31st at Fair Oaks. The 3rd Battalion, their first combat experience occurred during the fighting near Richmond, which during the battles known as the Seven Days Fighting from June 25th to July 1st. And that's where the six New Yorkers finally saw the elephant. Uh, the term seeing the elephant is a uh, term that was used by soldiers to describe their first experience in combat. The phrase to see the elephant probably dates to the early 1800s, and it was used uh, to describe something, something mysterious or exotic, perhaps a little frightening, something you couldn't describe to anyone unless you'd actually seen it. Here we can see uh, the Confederate uh, President Jeff Davis being tossed around by Uncle Sam the elephant. So Uncle Sam was seeing the elephant. McClellan's peninsula, peninsula campaign was ultimately a failure and most of his army was sent back towards Washington DC. However, companies F and H uh, remained on the peninsula and they withdrew back towards Williamsburg in August of 1862. It was an interesting experience because uh, the 6th New York joined with the 127th New York Infantry on, a, uh, on May 7th, 1863 on a raid towards the White House, Virginia. And I've often wondered whether the, the 127th um, men, many of whom came from the East End, 
may have met with some of the young men from the East End in the 6th New York Cavalry. Uh, so it's kind of intriguing to think whether they actually got a chance to, to catch up with old friends. Uh, the the uh, soldiers were transferred to uh, West Point, Virginia by boat. And uh, during the fighting that occurred there, uh, the young boyish looking Lieutenant Crozier uh, was killed in combat uh, when his horse fell on him. Uh, there were lots of ways to die uh, during the Civil War. Companies F and H remained on the peninsula until about August 1863. And so while the 3rd Battalion was on the peninsula, the rest of the 6th New York Cavalry saw action at 2nd Bull Run in August of 1862, which was a Union defeat, at Antietam in September of 1862, which was a partial Union victory, fought again in, in December of 1862 at Fredericksburg, which was a Union defeat, again on, at Chancellorsville in May of 1863, which was a Union defeat, and at Gettysburg in July of 1863, which was a Union victory. After the significant casualties that uh, the Union incurred, especially at Gettysburg, the Union Army needed more men. And so the sixth, uh, the, uh, the battalion of uh, Sixth New York that was on the peninsula was sent back to return to rejoin the rest of the regiment. And the regiment was now fighting as a whole and they were part of what was known as the second brigade of the first division of the Union Cavalry Corps and the Union Cavalry Corps composed of about 10,000 men. The uh, Six New York Cavalry fought in their first significant uh, battle together uh, at a battle called Brandy Station on October 11th in 1863. There a Union Cavalry force of about 7,000 men was nearly trapped by a Confederate Cavalry force of about half its size. I can imagine that uh, Colonel Devon was probably working his pipe pretty hard that day. At a uh, particularly important uh, critical moment in the battle, uh, Colonel Devon's commander, General John Buford, ordered the regiment to charge the Confederate cavalry. And they, uh, that fighting helped rescue another Union cavalry group that was commanded by George Custer. Yes, that George Custer. The hard fighting there earned the regiment its nickname, the Hard Hitters. Uh, during the fighting, the casual, uh, the Regiment in, uh, in, incurred casualties of about 27 men, which included Alonzo Foster's friend, Charles Jackson, who was wounded. This painting uh, is a depiction of the actual fighting and it was done by one of the members of the 6th New York Cavalry. As 1863 came to a close, the army realized that it was still facing a manpower shortage. Uh, this company shows a, uh, a company of the 3rd Pennsylvania Cavalry. Uh, there are about 35 men out of a company originally of about 100 men. So you can see that many of these companies were reduced uh, significantly and most of them fought uh, shorthanded throughout most of the war. In addition to casualties, uh, the Union Army was also facing uh, the expiration of the original three-year enlistment period. So as an inducement to re-enlist, the government offered a cash bonus and a month's leave if uh, soldiers would re-enlist. Re uh, Colonel Devon went to his troops, the 6th New York Cavalry, and asked if his men would volunteer and despite almost two years of constant fighting, including the recent battle at Brandy Station, nearly the entire regiment stepped forward, which was uh, quite a testament to their comradeship and their dedication to the Union cause. One of those who chose not to re-enlist was John Dix, the one whose brother fought for the Confederates. And I had made this presentation or a similar presentation at the Sag Harbor History Museum uh, recently. And after that presentation, um, I got contacted by one of John Dix's descendants who mentioned that um, John was actually sick at the time when the regiment um, re-enlisted. Re and there at the Pennsylvania hospital where he was recovering, a Philadelphia hospital where he was recovering, he met and married a young woman 
from Philadelphia, who I think may have been his nurse. His nurse. And uh, I'm just beginning to scratch the many of the histories of these young men. And I'm always welcoming anyone who has any information about some of these soldiers and uh, their histories. So 1864 brought a new year and also a new command for the Union Army. Ulysses Grant was now commander of all the Union armies and he brought with him General Philip Sheridan to be the commander of all of the Union cavalry uh, assigned to the Army of the Potomac. They brought with them a new strategy and a new style of war, which was basically to overwhelm the Confederates with their, uh, with their numbers and with their uh, equipment. At that time, the Union Army of the Potomac uh, consisted of about 119,000 men compared, compared with the Confederate Army of just about 64,000 men, so almost twice as large. The fighting in 1864 began uh, as the weather improved. The first significant fighting was at the Wilderness on May 4th through 8th, actually May, uh, May 9th. Um, and then uh, further fighting occurred on May 11th at Yellow Tavern, where Jeb Stewart, the Beau Sabreur, was killed in combat. That was followed by fighting at Spotsylvania Courthouse, North Anna on May 23rd, and finally at Cold Harbor on June 3rd. In nearly one month of continuous fighting, the Un Union Army had lost over 40,000 men killed or wounded in battle. At the same time, the 6th New York Cavalry had lost six men killed, 11 wounded, and two taken prisoner. It was a new kind of warfare uh, fought by a new kind of general. Mary Lincoln is reported to have said of Grant, he is a butcher and he's not fit to be the head of, a, of an army. Despite the casualties, Grant had still failed to take Richmond by direct attack. So he decided to, take, to cross the James River and take Petersburg instead and cut off uh, Richmond from its supply lines. In order to distract uh, Lee from uh, Grant's movement. He sent the cavalry under the command of uh, General Sheridan to Trevelyan Station on June 11th and 12th. Uh, at that battle, 9,000 Union cavalrymen uh, fought against almost 7,000 Confederates. And it was probably the largest cavalry, all cavalry battle during the Civil War. During that fighting, the 6th Cavalry uh, New York Cavalry lost uh, approximately 40 men, including Alonzo Foster's best friend, Milton Bennett, the man who had shared um, Alonzo's blanket. Also at Trevelyan Station, uh, I think that's where Alonzo Foster lost his hat. Alonzo's uh, captain who was standing nearby said, that was a close call, my boy. And uh, again, this is that hat. And I think you can see the hole at the top and at the back, there's an exit hole, kind of hard to see, but the bullet went through the top and out the back. After Tavellian Station, Union Army, uh, Union Cavalry rejoined Sheridan, uh, rejoined General Grant for the siege of Petersburg. And as a distraction for the infamous Battle of the Crater, which occurred on July 30th, uh, Grant sent the Union Cavalry uh, to Deep Bottom, Virginia, as a feint to distract the Union or the Confederate Cavalry. The uh, Union Cavalry crossed the James River at Deep Bottom on July 27th, and the men rode at night. Uh, lit on a on by road on that was lit by torches and bonfires and it you know, made me think of the almost uh, apocalyptic apocalyptic image from the movie apocalypse now this is the bridge that they crossed to, uh, to go to deep bottom although it was uh, only a minor minor battle it was no less dangerous um, and the union army lost about 500 casualties compared to about 700 
for the rebels. One of the casualties that the Union incurred was Alonzo Foster. A bullet struck my left hand, passing completely through it and nearly severing it from my wrist, Alonzo wrote. The soldier next to uh, Alonzo cried out, good God, Foster is killed too. Uh, but Foster was not killed, but his war was over. After Alonzo Foster was wounded, the 6th New York Cavalry was sent to the Shenandoah Valley as part of General Sheridan's 40,000 man army of the Shenandoah. The Shenandoah Valley was known as the breadbasket uh, for the Confederate Army, uh, where they received much of their supplies and food. General Grant ordered Sheridan, um, we want the Shenandoah Valley to remain a barren wasteland. So in September, um, uh, General Sheridan's army was sent to the valley. Early in September, the 6th New York Cavalry was surprised but while they were guarding a wagon train near the town of Berryville. You can see that uh, near the top, September 3rd and 5th. During the fighting there, uh, the New York, 6th of New York lost about 52 men. Fortunately, the Army's paymaster's cash box was saved from the rebels. Sheridan defeated the Confederates in the valley at uh, 3rd Winchester on September 19th, at Fisher's Hill on September 21st, and finally at Cedar Creek on October 19th. Sheridan's victories were not without controversy, however, and it was marred by an um, event known as the burning, burning which um, the people in the Shenandoah Valley remain, uh, uh, think of till today. Um, the goal of the Sheridan's campaign was to deny the Confederacy the means of feeding and supplying its army. And uh, Sheridan was uh, army ruthlessly burned crops, barns, mills, and factories throughout the Shenandoah Valley. This was a, a new form of war, a total war, and it's not unlike what we're witnessing today in the Ukraine. Uh, the area of the most significant burning you can see here on the lower left-hand side, but burning and destruction occurred pretty much throughout the Shenandoah Valley at that time. As winter came, uh, the 6th New York Cavalry went into winter quarters at a town called Lovettsville. Lovettsville was, um, was strongly unionist and uh, they welcomed the New Yorkers uh, openly. Uh, Lovettsville is on the border between pro-union West Virginia and rebel Virginia. And that could be a very dangerous place as uh, uh, rebel partisans, which were known as bushwhackers, would often attack small cavalry uh, outposts. While in Lovettsville, this man, Peter Haskins, a 20 year old lieutenant in Company H, which was where the New York or the North Fork troopers fought, uh, young Peter met and courted a young woman by the name of Lizzie George. She had a fancy for a local boy also, and uh, he happened to be fighting for the rebels. In the end, Lizzie chose the local boy and for young Peter Haskin, love was found and lost in Lovettsville. In the spring of 1865, uh, it was time to end the war and there, the Union Army was looking for a way to bring that the war to a rapid conclusion. And uh, Sheridan, Sheridan brought his troopers back to rejoin Grant outside of Petersburg. And on April 1st, at a battle called Five, uh, Five Forks, 22,000 Union soldiers uh, fought against 10,000 Confederates and beat them badly. That caused Richmond to be evacuated on April 2nd. Shortly thereafter, on April 6th, 6th uh, the Union and, Cav uh, Union and Confederate forces met again at Sailor's Creek, where the Union cavalry basically destroyed Lee's army. The Confederates lost approximately 7,700 men versus the Union losses of about 1,000. 
After that battle, Lee exclaimed, my God, has the army dissolved? And for the most part, it probably had. And Lee ultimately surrendered to General Grant on April 9th at Appomattox. The last uh, casualty for the 6th New York actually occurred on that day, April 9th, and it was Henry Preston, who came from Shelter Island. He was wounded in the ankle. So the war was over, and uh, now it was time to tally the butcher's bill. Here's uh, the grave of Milton Bennett. Nearly 2,000 soldiers served in the 6th New York Cavalry during the war. Most of them were from New York State. Of that total, about 30% were casualties, which meant killed, wounded, or captured. And of the total, 10% of the men died in combat or from disease. Disease was, was really the greatest killer of soldiers during the war, not combat. Interesting to note that the 5th New York Cavalry, which was the 6th New York's sister regiment, lost nearly 50% in casualties. And uh, the reason why the 6th had fewer casualties was in large measure due to the good leadership of Colonel Devon, who uh, knew how not to make reckless attacks, unlike some of his contemporaries. As a comparison, uh, the average New York Infantry Regiment suffered about 40% casualties, of which 13% died in combat or disease. Of the 143 battles, engagements, or skirmishes in which the 6th New York Cavalry fought, five actions stand out. At Chancellorsville in April of 1863, the regiment lost 72 men in three days of fighting. Most of them were missing in action and more than likely were prisoners of war. At Berryville, which was in the Shenandoah Valley, the regiment lost 52 men Again, the, march, the majority of those were wounded, I'm sorry, were missing. At Trevelyan Station, 40 men were lost, including Milton Bennett, who was killed. At Brandy Station, 27 men were lost. And on June 23rd, 1864, at an obscure crossing called Jones Bridge, the regiment lost 22 men, seven of whom were killed in combat. Of those five major uh, actions, companies F and H, the men from East End, participated in four of those. Of the 32 total men from the East End who joined the regiment, 27 original and five who subsequently enlisted. One of them was killed in action. Three men returned home wounded. And although uh, of those wounded, none were significantly um, wounded if you don't count losing your left hand is being serious. Um, four men were taken prisoner, and of those, three have died in, of disease in captivity. The other captured man survived, but was uh, permanently disabled. Two other men died of disease during the course of the war. So there were a total of five men who died of disease from the East End. Seven men were discharged early due to sickness or disability. So when you add it all up, about 50% of the East End, boy, East End boys were physical casualties of war. Of the original um, 27 men, only seven were able to serve throughout the uh, and return back to their home. So the how about the uh, what happened to the uh, the other uh, brothers in arms? As we discussed, uh, Melton Bennett was killed in action. Alonzo Foster was wounded. George Ware, the son of the shopkeeper, uh, survived the heavy fighting throughout 1863, but then contracted diphtheria in the spring of 1864 and died in the hospital at Harwood in Washington, DC on April 22nd in 1864. He's buried at the soldier's home in uh, Washington, DC. John Dix, as we discussed, did not re-enlist. He got married, moved to New Jersey, and where he died in 1919. Fred Wadley, the Englishman, uh, survived the war unhurt and returned to Southampton, and then ultimately returned to England, where he died in 1901. Charles Whitney uh, was discharged from the army. 
uh, for disability and returned to North Haven where he was working as a farmer. There he married in September, 1865, and he had five children. In addition to farming, Charles was the street commissioner in Sag Harbor and worked at the watch case factory. Charles Jackson, uh, the young man from uh, Good Ground, whose father married one of Alonzo's sisters, fell ill at the end of the war and returned to Good Ground severely weakened. He died shortly after his return in October 1860, 1880, 1866, and he's buried in Hampton Bays. He was uh, just 26 years old and another casualty of war. So how do you honor these men who served? This is the monument to the 6th New York Cavalry at Gettysburg. Unfortunately, Charles Jack Jackson did not survive to see the dedication of the monument, which was, which was done in uh, July of 1889. But as a fitting epitaph to his friend, Alonzo provided a portrait of Charles to be used in the monument. On the monument, there's a large uh, bronze panel, which depicts a cavalry charge, which actually didn't happen and by men who actually weren't at Gettysburg. It captures the moment, actually captures the moment when Charles was wounded at Brandy Station. And as Charles is wounded uh, and is falling from his horse, uh, Alonzo Foster, that's his image there, was reach, it reaches out to grasp the regiment's flag before it falls to the ground. And as we talked about, uh, neither Foster nor Jackson were at Gettysburg, but they were in fact on the peninsula at the time. The man leading the charge uh, is, depicts Colonel Charles Fitzhugh. Fitzhugh was also not at Gettysburg. And in fact, he did not join the 6th New York Cavalry until the end of the war. And the fourth major image on this uh, plaque, the uh, man who is on the far right-hand side of the screen, is uh, Jerome Wheeler, a lieutenant in the 6th New York Cavalry, and he actually was at Gettysburg. And after the war, uh, Jerome became a part owner of the Macy's company until he sold his interest in 1888 to focus on silver mining in Aspen, Colorado. And while he was living in Aspen, he built the Wheeler Opera House and the Hotel Jerome, and he also lost his fortune there. Here's uh, Colonel Fitzhugh, that's him on the left, and Jerome Wheeler on the right. Southampton also had its own memorial, the Soldiers and Sailors Monument, which was dedicated in 1897. And in Sag Harbor, the, uh, the monument there was dedicated in October of 1896. One of the veterans who was at this dedication was Charles Whitney. And that's, I believe, him on the far left-hand side with other men from Sag Harbor. Sadly, um, Charles died 10 days after this uh, monument was dedicated. He died of a heart attack and he's buried in Sag Harbor's Oakland Cemetery. So what happened to, uh, to Alonzo Foster? After he was wounded, he, he was sent to the hospital where he recovered. He returned to good ground after the war and became the keeper of the Pong Quag, which is known as the Shinnecock Lighthouse, where he worked from 1866 to 1869. He then moved to Brooklyn, where he worked in the customs office and was active in New York Veterans Affairs. He died on September 11th, 1913, and he is buried in good ground. October 15th was also an important day for Alonzo Foster. It was his birthday. It was the day that he enlisted in the army. And it was the day that he married Georgina Squires in 1865. It was also the day in 1890 when he chose to start a journey to visit his old battlefields. While he was there, he gathered an acorn near the grave of 2,000 unknown Union dead at Arlington. And later he gathered some seeds near a monument to unknown Confederate dead at Manassas. 
He brought those seeds back with him to good ground and he planted them where he wrote, they shall grow side by side and equal care shall be bestowed upon both. And in that uh, spirit, um, the 50th reunion at Gettysburg was dedicated to Lincoln's call to bind up the nation's wounds. And here the North and South veterans are shaking hands across the high watermark at the Battle of Gettysburg. And I thought it was remarkable that uh, after all the suffering and loss uh, that these men experienced, they were still able to reach across and uh, became friends. So I want to dedicate this to the memory of these fine men who, many of whom paid the supreme sacrifice to defend our country. Uh, thank you very much for your time.